Transformation is a potent word, a powerful concept. But what does it mean in relation to a society? Can the spiritual DNA of a community really be altered? If so, what kind of features does this new blueprint produce? In this program, we'll attempt to answer these and other important questions. We'll visit several communities whose streets and institutions have lately been rattled by the power of the Holy Spirit. We'll examine both the causes and the effects of this most impressive phenomena. To take us on this journey, we join noted investigative researcher George Otis Jr., a man who spent years reading signposts on the road to community transformation. Community transformation is a concept that many Christians struggle with. But where does this tentativeness come from? My own observation is that it derives largely from the limitations of our own life experience. If you ask believers if they've experienced spiritual revival, most will say yes. Ask if they're convinced that large-scale church growth can happen, and they will invariably cite specific examples. But what almost no one has experienced, at least in the Western world, is a profound and pervasive transformation of their community. And as a result, we're inclined to think it's unattainable. But is this a valid assumption? I'd like to invite you to journey with me to four communities that have been dramatically altered by the power of the Holy Spirit. Four communities that offer a shining example of what can happen when God comes to town. was well known as the drug capital of the world and along with that all the violence and corruption sin of every kind you can imagine the violence was getting worse the church was really feeling the pressure of what was going on so here in the Amazon which is the Colombia Amazon Brazilian Amazon and Peruvian Amazon this is where many of the laboratories, cocaine laboratories oh, yeah. are. Marcy and Randy McMillan are veteran ministers who have lived in Cali more than 20 years. At least 10 of them have been spent in the shadow of the city's infamous drug lords. They've seen the devastating effects of the cartel's ruthless control. And they've seen it right in their own backyard. When illicit drug money began pouring into Cali in the 1980s, the cocaine lords moved into the McMillan's upscale neighborhood buying up entire blocks of luxurious haciendas. Hey Randy, uh, this is uh, an unbelievable place here over to the right. This yes. wall looks like it's 20 to 25 feet high. Who lived here? The Orjuela Rodriguez family, which are heads of the Cali cartel. During that period of uh, their control over the country and cocaine and exportation involving, they said it, you know, 500 million a month. Was what, Whoa. The, what they were doing every month, just on a regular month. That's I mean, unbelievable. Without any, yeah, without anything special. And during that time, I mean, security and walls were everything for them. I mean, paranoia, um, paranoia, huh? fear. For years, Colombia was the world's biggest exporter of cocaine, sending upwards of 1,000 tons a year to the United States and Europe. The U.S. Drug Enforcement Agency called the Cali Cartel the largest, richest, and best organized criminal organization in history. With billions of dollars at their disposal, their reach was pervasive, especially in Cali itself. They really controlled the whole socioeconomic situation, the political situation, and even very much the religious. Terrible. It was terrible. At that time, drug trafficking in Cali was one of the most powerful in the world. People would die easily. If you were riding around in a car and there was a confrontation, it was a miracle if you or the driver weren't killed. And people walked around full of fear. I personally saw five people killed in Cali. There were many journalists who were killed for denouncing what the mafia was doing in Colombia. Important political decisions for the country were manipulated by drug trafficking money, influencing all aspects of society. It touched everything, absolutely everything. You know, have, this is just one of 1,200 properties that they had in Cali. 
To freely walk the streets that once held so much terror is testimony to the remarkable changes that have come to Cali. But where did it all begin? This story, like all transformation accounts, is rooted in the hearts of intercessors, men and women who had ears to hear what God was saying. God spoke to us that we should come to Cali. Ruth Royball and her husband Julio came to Cali in 1978. They were dismayed at the utter darkness that had settled over the city. But Julio was convinced that if the people of God would join together and pray, the enemy's grip would be broken. There was just one problem. No one wanted to do this. It wasn't really unity among the churches. You did your thing and I say, God bless you, brother, and, and have a wonderful time in your church, but this is my church and this is what I do. The pastor's association used to consist of nothing more than a box of files. Every pastor was working separately on his own. No one would join together. Following a disagreement, Julio pulled out of the already weak pastor's association. But then he realized he was contributing to the disunity. God spoke to him and told him, you don't have the right to be offended. And you have to forgive. And he took that message and he realized, he said, if I'm going to reflect Jesus, I cannot be uh, offended in any way. Julio went back to the pastors and begged their forgiveness. They could not afford to walk in disunity, not when their city faced such overwhelming challenges. We started realizing, well, what hope do we have? We had all these international organizations, plus all the Colombian authorities, against the Kali cartel and nothing ever happened. So being concerned for this, we started praying and interceding and asking the Lord to show us how to pray. And that's how he took us to understand our spiritual roots. To gain God's perspective on their city, local churches began to examine the spiritual dynamics in their immediate neighborhoods. One of the things we would do was uh, Randy would give out maps of the city and the government has it divided like in different areas, zones. And within those zones there are many neighborhoods, so we would divide the church up into these zones and according to the neighborhood where they lived, then they had to bring back information of all of the problems that they saw that were occurring, that were reoccurring, very strong problems within their area. One troubling discovery was the city's deep involvement with the occult. Even the macho drug lords were active clients of mediums and spiritual guides. Had very strong roots of occultic practices and that was mixed in with the religious leadership and that gave them power, aside from the power that they already had with their money. As they began to address specific strongholds over the city, Cali's pastors felt God leading them to assemble their people for an evening of joint worship and prayer. At the beginning, the problem was people saying, it won't work, the people might not come. And many opposed it, but we had leaders that dared to do things. They dared, understanding that it was God's will. In 95, we had our first all-night prayer meeting. Did you feel the mountains tremble? And they prayed against principalities and powers. They prayed for unity. They believed in God to see him move in the churches. The mayor at that time got on the platform, prayed for Kali and said, Kali belongs to Jesus Christ. And with those words, when the Christians heard them from the city authority, that was a confirmation of what the Holy Spirit was doing in the city. 48 hours after the event, the daily newspaper headlined, No Homicides. For the first time in as long as anyone could remember, Cali had gone an entire weekend without a single murder. A newsworthy event in a city used to seeing upwards of 15 killings per day. After these major prayer events, united prayer events were going on, that's when we started seeing the results. And 10 days later, the first drug lord fell, and God was changing the city. Encouraged by the spiritual momentum generated by the first all-night prayer vigil, church leaders decided to rent the largest venue in the city 
the 55,000 seat Pascual Guerrero Soccer Stadium. Their faith was amply rewarded when more than 60,000 believers showed up to pray and worship across denominational lines. During the summer of 1995, the Colombian government declared all-out war against the drug lords. 6,500 elite commandos were dispatched to Cali with explicit orders to round up the cartel's ringleaders. There were seven uh, top drug lords, six, had fallen in those nine months when we really started praying together. The whole spiritual atmosphere of the city of Cali has changed. While Julio was encouraged by God's handiwork, he faced opposition in his own backyard. A neighbor, angry over disputed property rights, threatened to kill him. So Julio said, I'm going to fast and pray until I know what's happening. So he was fasting, and on the third day, God spoke to him, and he said, he will do you great damage. But from what he does, the revival in Cali will spring forth. I want to tell you people, this is a very dangerous thing that we're doing here tonight. He had a meeting with the pastor's association, the board. I was waiting for him with the other pastors at 2 o'clock that afternoon. He told us to drop him off. The chauffeur kept saying, no, let me take you to the door. Let me wait with you. But I said, no, just, just leave me here. I can walk. He got out. He started walking towards the church. Two hitmen were waiting in ambush for him. That was the last time I saw him. I got a call and they said, they just killed Julio. And I said, nah, how can they kill a pastor? So I went to the place thinking he was just hurt. But when I got there, he was lying on his side like a baby. Julio, the noisy one, the active one, the man who just never sat still, there he was lying like a baby. When they first told me about it, it's, you're in shock. You can't believe it really happened. And as I arrived, his body was still on the street. There was a pool of blood by his head where he had been shot. The verse that came to me just by the Spirit of God was precious in the eyes of the Lord by the death of the saints. And as I just stepped out and sat next to his body, I knew I was on holy ground. And I just said, Lord, I know that you know everything in our hearts, but this I have to say, it is well with my soul. This is what you wanted and it's well with my soul. In shock and struggling to understand God's purposes in this tragedy, hundreds of Christians gathered at Julio's funeral, including many pastors who had not even been speaking to each other. And all the pastors came forward and we embraced each other and we made a covenant of unity, saying that we would not let things get between us. Today, this covenant of unity extends to some 200 pastors and serves as the backbone of the city's high-profile prayer vigils. It has led to an absolute transformation to this city. Corruption has been reduced dramatically. The, the cocaine drug cartels have been shattered in this city. There are about 60,000 people, and they've come here to spend the entire night praying that God would continue the marvelous work He has been doing in this city for 36 consecutive months. While thousands of exuberant worshipers lit up the inside of the stadium, staff security was forced to turn away an additional 15,000 participants at the gate. Undaunted, the latecomers formed an impromptu praise march that circled the stadium for hours. What you're seeing here today in this stadium is, is a miracle. Uh, you know that some years ago it would have been impossible for evangelicals to gather like this, but, but God is raising up His church. Hallelujah. And, and Hallelujah. we're going to meet that need in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. This is what's happening Hallelujah. today in Colombia. This is something that pastors and intercessors in the United States, in Europe, all over the world need to witness. This is what God is doing in our day. And we 
As the kingdom of God has descended upon Cali, many prominent citizens have come into relationship with Christ. Rafael Araujo Gámez is Colombia's leading sports commentator. For years, he's broadcast championship soccer matches from the stadium. I am here today because six months ago, I came to know Jesus, and I accepted him as my savior. I have been worshiping him and praising him ever since. How does the excitement of what's going on in the Vigilia compared to the soccer matches. There is no comparison. With the soccer games, it's just a lot of yelling and screaming. Here you enjoy it from the heart. Are you a pretty happy man the last six months? Usted es un hombre bien feliz en esos últimos seis meses? Yes, diferente, gozoso. Muy enjoys. <laughs> muy gozoso. Very different. I have been changed. I am very sí, joyful. Sí, sí. Joyful. Sí. It's a different life. <laughs> Mario Hinete is a prominent attorney and motivational speaker whose radio program is heard throughout Latin America. After searching for peace in various New Age and self-help organizations, he finally came home to Christ. From that moment on, I started to find a real peace inside of me. I definitely believe that even though I'm a spiritual baby, the answer is here in the Bible. I feel I lost 41 years of my life, but I know now that God has a plan for me. Mario's new passion is to learn the ways of God and serve Him through the media. I understand that God is saying to me, it's not the way you want it, it's the way I want it. And I say, yes, so be it, Lord. It's what you want, but use me. I want to serve you. For the unsaved people, all of a sudden they're coming to the place, hey, what do we have here? Where are we going? What hope is there? There's corruption here. There's fraud there. There's every place they look, there's, it's always coming up to a dead end. And all of a sudden they're saying, there's got to be an answer. There's got to be an answer. And, and you combine that with a church saying, there is an answer. There is an answer. And you've got an explosion coming. Even city officials acknowledge the positive effects of the gospel. The government officials were saying to the president of the Pastors Association, hey, listen, you know, we, we need more of you guys uh, in the government. We need honest people like you guys. And the mayor had said, I can't charge you for, for using the stadium because you're doing us a favor. So now they're looking at the church like we are bringing something positive. When local churches wanted to offer a spiritual alternative to Cali's traditional fare, a 10-day event usually accompanied by drunken debauchery, city officials agreed. Not only would they give the Christians rent-free use of the 22,000-seat velodrome, they would also pay for the advertising, sound support, and security. This new openness to the gospel is affecting all levels of society. Nowadays, it is no longer viewed as strange to have the Lord in our daily lives. Upper-class people are accepting that Jesus is a need in their lives, and they don't view it as something ridiculous, because before they thought it was a joke. That was the worst thing that you could bring up in a conversation. Nowadays, you can speak about God, and everybody will respect it and is interested. Explosive church growth is happening all over the city, across denominational lines.